welcome. I am so excited that you are here. I'm Jackie Simmons, the host of the show. And today we are going to be waking up the world and we are gonna wake up the world with one of my favorite people. So I'm really happy and excited to be able to invite into the studio in one minute, Ms. Kelly Kalen. There are some people who figure out what they're supposed to be doing early in life and keep and continue on and do amazing things in one lane. And then there are people like Kelly who allow their lives to unfold with multiple petals like a beautiful rose. And that's who we're gonna be meeting now. So you are creative, resourceful and whole with Ms. Kelly Kalen, Reverend Kelly Kalen. Please join me in the studio. Let's get this party started. Wow, what a what a lovely introduction. You have so touched my heart. Thank you, Jackie. <laughs> you're very, very welcome, Kelly. I am so excited that you're here. Okay, so we've got to get my camera stable. And so get yourself where you can put a pl put a plant. And because otherwise I'm gonna be trying to keep up with you and we're gonna make everybody see sick. <laughs> Good morning, Kelly. Good morning, Jackie. It's so lovely to be here with you. This is going to be a lot of fun because this concept of being creative, resourceful, and whole is so near and dear to the whole conversation around how do you stay mentally and emotionally resourceful. When we met, you were pursuing a career in business. Mm -hmm. So yes. why don't you take us on that journey? Because this has just been the most fun. Yeah, there's uh, been a lot of things that I've done in my life. I started out as a CPA and uh, had a master's in tax and did, did the whole, you know, you should be a doctor, a CPA, a lawyer or something along the lines like that. Uh, I did that whole track. Then I ended up divorced and in a place where I had to reclimb that career ladder. Okay, and I, so we, we have to pause there because there, there's just too much history in that one line. And then I ended up divorced. Hold it. Yeah, we, we don't, we, we have a lot of emotional layers on that journey, Kelly. A lot, yes. Yeah. So what... Let's, let's make it really simple. What, how old were you when you hit this place of, oh crap, I'm at the bottom, I have to reclimb? I was 40. Yeah. I was 40. And so reclimbing that corporate ladder, you know, you, I decided I wanted to climb the ladder that I wanted to climb and not be beholden to staying as a CPA and doing work that really felt very soul sucking to me. And so I jumped into photography and video and became a video producer and enjoyed that so much. It was much more my lane. It has both the creative and the logical parts and it fit me very, very well. And I enjoyed that time of my life so much. And I don't think it's over yet. All right. So from CPA to be to video producer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a significant walk. I guess the creative part in this, where did wholeness come in? Your wholeness comes in with my spirituality and recognizing that no matter what, I, I'm a whole being, I am a whole person. And we are taught very from very young age that, you know, we're not good enough or, or we, I guess we, we take on that, uh, that, that whole mindset of not being good enough, of not being worthy. And when I started exploring that for myself and realizing that I am worthy and it's worth my time to spend time on me, I started becoming whole again. And that's where that came in for me. Worth my time to spend time on me is a lovely, lovely phrase. I like that a lot. I'm going to take you back a minute 
and I'm going to invite you to share as much as you want to share about how we intersected on this concept of suicide and specific and suicide prevention. Where did that intersect your life? Well, um, unfortunately, my mom took her life when I was 18. Uh, she was 40, <laughs> which is interesting. Uh, so it was, uh, it's a very shattering experience. I don't care what age you are. To have someone that you care about and love try or actually manage to die, it's, it's completely shattering. It changes your world. And you have to start reevaluating what's important. And so when my mom passed, um, that was a whole journey in and of itself. And that's, you know, my commonality with the Suicide Prevention Show. There's so much that comes with that experience. It's a very deep, emotionally charged, heart-wrenching experience. And so that's how my path intersected with yours on that. When we talk about suicide and we talk about someone that we care about, and not just care about in your case, somebody who you relied on deciding to die. Kelly, the easy way to talk about this is to talk about it and not to share the story. And so your willingness to be, and, and in my case, you, to avoid the talk altogether, which I did for decades. So I have nothing but extreme gratitude for the fact that you're willing to come on, talk about your journey now, and the fact that it was born out of this emotional place that is difficult to, to explain. Uh, absolutely. Yep. It, I mean, it truly, it truly is uh, a, a difficult place. And I, I share because it's been one of those things that's been, you know, in the corner, underneath the covers or in the closet. And just like everything else that has become talked about and that we focus on, we need to bring this out of the shadows and we need to talk about it. We've got an epidemic going on, especially with COVID and the lockdowns and everything. This has become its own epidemic. And if we don't talk about it, it's just gonna get worse. And I don't want that to happen. I don't want anyone, anyone to go what either through either of us has gone through. It's, it's too, it's, it's, it's unnecessary for one thing. And it is just so shattering that it, it, it's just not a necessary place that we need to be. And I really, really want to stop people from committing suicide. And there's not a, there's not a valid reason for it. As far as I'm concerned, it, it really has to do with our mindset and our emotions and the way we're raised and that we treat each other like we're not good enough. And if we can start treating each other like we love each other and like we care about each other and we're each valuable and each of us is capable or completely creative, resourceful and whole, when we start treating each other like that, this epidemic will start dropping as well. So that's kind of my way of contributing to helping to stop this, this, this own epidemic, this suicide is, you know, oh, yeah, I could talk about it and I can <laughs> get exasperated about it. <laughs> it's easy to get exasperated about because from our perspective, it's easy to avoid. And yet for most of the world, getting caught up in the negative echo chamber of our minds is easier than it is to actually master some skills to be able to manage your own mindset. So, you know, I, you know me, I predate the word mindset. We used to just call it having an attitude. So being able to adjust your own attitude is where we're going to take people. Kelly, let's take them into these this three uh, pillars of being, because everything for me, I think today is going to fall into the category of suicide proof. So 
you know, the, the three pillars, according to Reverend Kelly, are creative, resourceful, and whole. So let's walk them through. What is the creative piece? What does that creative pillar look like for somebody who's saying, um, I have no place to start and, and creative is not me. What do you say to that person? Creative is all of us. If, if we are made in the image of God, God is a creator. And if you were a creator, wouldn't you create everything that you possibly could in every manageable size, shape, form, everything? I would. And we all have the capability, every single one of us, each one of us has the capability of being creative. We shut it off and we're taught to shut it off. So it's when we go into our heart, we can open that back up for ourselves. And that's really, I guess my point is being in our heart and not being in this little box in our head that we're taught to be. And so get into your heart and open that back up. And I promise you, you are way more creative than you think you are. And you can also do little things like take a two hour art class over Zoom. I know of some and they've been okay, wonderful. Hold it, hold it, hold it. You just you just set off a chain reaction. I can see it starting to happen. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because a lot of people equate creative with art. I do sometimes. And it is one place that creativity can be expressed for sure. But for people who are like, I art and I don't get along. Yeah. The, let's it's let's broaden opening. the spectrum just a little bit. And because and, and <laughs> you're right, there, there's a lot of different pathways that people can go on to explore their creativity. What is the what is the problem of not expressing your creativity? How does that show up in someone's life? Personally, I think you get feel very stuck. You're the, you know, you come home, you'll drink a bottle of wine or a beer and sit in front of the television. And that's absolutely stifles creativity. Whereas you can follow what I call the breadcrumb trail or the light trail and you can, whatever, whatever lights up for you, it can be cooking, it can be gardening, it doesn't matter what it is. It's what, it, what's peaks, whatever piques your interest, whatever sounds interesting to you, explore it. And you don't have to marry it, just explore it. And that will start opening your creativity. You might find Today, you want to do some gardening, and next week, you want to learn how to paint cars. I don't know. Find out something or, or seek the thing that, that lights up for you and explore it, and then you can, you'll find a way to open up your creativity more. All right. So I just got, uh, you know me, I love alliteration. So here's, here's my thinking. You can tell me if I'm on the right track. The fastest path to finding my creative expression is to be curious about it. Absolutely. That's exactly right. And explore it. Don't just say, hmm, that's curious and leave it sitting in the corner. Oh, no. If I'm curious about something, I've got to go, you know, I'm like a cat. You, know, you got to go pat at it. And, yeah. <laughs> so so I, I, cool. All right. So this idea that one of the things that keeps us here, keeps us engaged in our life, is creative expression. And it doesn't have to be through one of the formal arts, it's just creative expression. And I really love the fact that you started there. You know, what I've seen coming up is that when it comes to managing mental and emotional stability and mindset and all of the different words that are used around this topic. Now I've got my own favorite set of words. The biggest challenge is that people have these very boxed in, very linear definitions of what it means to be healthy, of what has to be in place, the rules. They have really weird rules weird to me. They have a lot of, here we go, this is it. They have a lot of rules 
around what has to be in place before they can be happy. You know, so creativity, I think, can, is a way to bypass all of the rules. So yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely, and and bypassing those rules is something that's really important as well. That that that's the box of the mind, and when you're like when you're in this box of the mind, you are really really stuck. And so, <laughs> Getting out of that. There we go. In a world that worships the mind, because we do live in a world of head games and rationalizations and, and disconnect from our bodies. You know, in, in a world that worships the mind to be told what you just said is just delightful. So thank you. <laughs> it's all about it's all about getting past that. And you know, we're taught as children to get, you know, get out of our creativity and to just focus on what we think as opposed to how we feel and, and being curious and using our minds to facilitate the, the exploration of this wonderful world. That's, that's really what it is for me. I want to explore. I want to see what the world has to offer and, and play with it. And when I can do that, I'm creative. And it doesn't matter if I'm cooking or cleaning the house or mowing the lawn or gardening. It doesn't matter. There you Just go. Just be curious. Just go after it. So we have a pillar of curiosity. And the next pillar that you shared with me was this one of resourcefulness. So I'm going to go where angels fear to tread. And I'm going to say, all right, Kelly, what was your life like when you felt resourceless? That you didn't have any resources. I felt like a fish out of water, just flopping around, having no control about where I'm at, just being able to do this. Uh, it, it was a, a very dark time for me. And I couldn't see past the, the feeling of being out of control, of not having any foundation uh, that felt like something I could stand on for a little while and just kind of stop the world and feel protected. And so that's how I felt when I felt resourceless. I also went into depression, uh, which I now have figured out happens for me when I go against myself over and over and over again. And it's in those two times that I felt the more, most resourceless. What does it mean to go against yourself? Not listening to what you know is right for you. So Just what was the experience? What was the, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to, to, cause, cause I know that you have an amazing ability to share information, but I really want to know what it took before this turned around for you. And this is going to, I think, be inspiring to a lot of people. This place that you share from Kelly, when you're willing to say what it was true for you. And I know that the, the journey is an amazing one. What did resourcefulness Ness, where you felt like you had no resources. What was going on in your life at that time? Well, the first major part of that was having lost my mom at 18, mm -hmm. a very young and tender age. And it's volatile enough at that age, right? Life is volatile enough and it's and you're wondering what's going on anyway. And then it just felt like somebody just took the rug right out from underneath me and I just went flipping around. Yeah. That took me a little while to get to a point where I felt like I had the ability to create a little bit of foundation for myself, a little stability in my yeah. life. I'm going to just butt in because I know a piece of your story and I want to highlight this for people because this is what your inside experience was like. And on the outside, you were handling every single detail of the, the passing of your mom, 
the keeping your the family together, your siblings, your dad, keeping holding the world together on the outside. Mm -hmm. And this went on for how long? That on the outside, you were holding the world together for everybody. That's probably about 10 years. All right. So I just want to be probably really, really years. clear with what this journey is like, because this is such a powerful piece for me that from the inside experience, you felt like you had zero resources. And from the outside experience, you were so resourceful, you held the world together for everyone. Yes, uh, went to school, I was in college, and I continued in college. And yeah, and people didn't really know. They didn't really know what was going on inside me. I kept a good facade on. I was very good at that facade. And yeah, that was... That's, that's a really trying time when you feel completely out of control inside and you're controlling everything you can on the outside. It's a desperate place, or it was for me. Um, I believe it was Thoreau who said that most men lead lives of quiet desperation. This is not a new phenomenon, but we have a new level of it that we are dealing with. And so Kelly, thank you for being willing to open up that piece and expose this gap between what we see on the outside, what's, what we show to the world, what the world can see and what we feel on the inside. It's how the yes. whole, you can't tell by looking kind of movement came up. And so um, your help, by the way, in creating that whole concept of the suicide risk factor assessment is greatly, greatly appreciated. And so that's something that we'll be talking about more later on today. Um, let's bring it back to resourcefulness. What was the first resource that you remember finding for yourself? The first... I guess the first resource that I kind of fell into uh, was my ex-husband. And he was willing to take care of some things that I just didn't have the wherewithal at the time to do. And I think that, that he was probably my first person I could kind of count on to help me through it. Um, and bless his heart for all his faults, he did help me through it. Um, what did you come on the lawn? I mean, you know, when he was, he was an emotional support. He truly okay. was, uh, th this was early on in our relationship and his support was invaluable and he helped me feel at least somewhat stable, have at Hi. least some foundation, some stable foundation. It, it was rocky. It wasn't built well. <laughs> it was not a very good foundation. And yet it was something that gave me, it was a port in a storm would be a good way to put it. It was a port in a storm. It was a and, huge improvement from where you were. Let's just, yeah. Yes, it, it really was. And it was something that I just, you know, I needed that branch to hold on to or that log in the middle of the river to hold on to for a while to just kind of catch my breath and go, okay, that happened. Now, <laughs> where do we go from here? <laughs> Got it. All right. So he provided you a place that at least was sort of stable to be able to reassess your world. What was the next resource? What was the next resource piece on the resource journey? I would have to say for me, it was getting out of college and, and starting, uh, starting to work and being able to actually keep a job and, and do the work as a CPA that I was doing. That helped me a lot. It helped my confidence because I was able to graduate. I was able to graduate in accounting, which is not, it's not an easy track. It's not an easy degree. And so I think that that helped me stabilize even a little bit more. Cool. So feeling resourceful, the experience of that is feeling stable. And that's really a cool thing to be able to help people hook together. Sort of like 
I know I'm resourceful when I feel stable. Well, maybe you can be resourceful even if you don't, I guess. But it's a good thing to just recognize that they can play together. Cool. All right. So along the journey of resourcefulness, where do you recommend that people start looking or when do you recommend people start looking for their resources? I think that they, they kind of really always do. They're, it, it's a lot done unconsciously. I don't think we realize that we build these foundations whatever they are. You know, we build the foundation of a stable, of a family life. And especially with our parents, we, well, we either have that stability or not with our parents. I did. I had some stability until my early teens with my parents. And so that, that was the initial build of a foundation, the initial looking at of resources for that purpose. How do we go through life though? Life really throws us some bombs. And, you know, my folks got divorced. That was the first time the rug was pulled out from underneath me and made me feel like, you know, I really had no place to land. And how do I, how do I fix this? Right. And so I think we do it all through our lives. I don't think it, it starts as an adult or something like that. So it's really about what we feel we need for ourselves to create uh, to create our world and to create some semblance of a reality for ourselves so that we can function in this world. So all through life, all through life, I've reevaluated this. I've looked at it. I've had the rug pulled out from me a number of times where my foundation just went spiraling, uh, kind of like Charlie Brown kicking the football. You know, it's just it, your, your life can, is going to spiral at times. So for me, creating that resourcefulness, that foundation within me, instead of focusing on the things on the outside was what helped, started helping me the most. It's what really gives me my stability. What's one thing that someone can do that will help them recognize where they already have foundational elements in their life? For me, I mean, it's as simple as having a bed to sleep in, a roof over my head. These are foundational pieces in our life, just having the basics. Okay, so and writing the list of, of the basics, recognizing that it could be that simple. Okay, that's really key because I wouldn't have thought of that. All right, so something as, as basic as having that stability is a list of where you have resources. You've yes, got resources and, and, to have a roof over your head. That's an, that's That brings it down to where it applies to everyone. And Kelly, that was lovely. All right, I want to make sure that we catch all three pillars and open it up for questions. So we've got the pillar of creativity and the need that the, the, the key is to stay curious and explore because creativity could look different for different people. We're not necessarily talking art lessons, but art lessons are a good place to start. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the resourcefulness. Um, wow, talk about starting at the, the beginning. It, you know, I got, a, I got resources, I got a bed to sleep in. That's starting at the beginning and that's a place for it. Just about everybody can start. So Absolutely. whole. All right, I left this one because whole is something that is not a, um, it's not a comfortable place for me to go. I'll just say that. I don't even know what whole means in this day and age. So take us there. Oh, wow. That's a, it's a big subject in and of itself. For me, not being whole it feels like I'm scattered and I'm, I, I have my energy is all over the place and being able to, to bring that in to, to be within myself in a way that feels stable, but not from the point of what the world thinks is stable, being stable and whole for me. And that, that can look, that looks like something different for every person. Wholeness can mean things like, gee, 
you know, I'm not taking good care of my health and I need to add that type of a activity and a regime into my life. Without it, I don't feel like I'm doing the best that I can in my life. And I feel scattered when I don't exercise. I feel stuck when I don't exercise. And so for me, that's one thing that makes me feel whole. And really, it's about having a relationship with myself, an honorable relationship with myself, where I am, I'm going to steal something from Don Miguel Ruiz, impeccable with my word, with me. And wow. that's huge because we lie to ourselves all the time. Like I'm going to exercise tomorrow and then you don't do it. Or I'm not going to eat that piece of cake and then you go off and you do it. So it's really about being impeccable with my word, with myself, having a good solid relationship with me so that I can have good solid relationships with you and other people and God. The infinite intelligence, our creator, our source, because if we don't have that relationship with ourselves first, all of our relationships are going to be based on this rocky foundation of our relationship with ourselves. So that's really a very a, a critical piece in my mind of being whole is that relationship with ourselves. I love the fact that you made it so tangible and easy to understand because a relationship with myself is a huge concept. This breaking it down to, am I keeping my word? If I say I'm going to exercise, am I exercising? If I tell myself I'm going to you know, abstain from something, am I abstaining from something? Am I not eating the chocolate cake? You know, th these are very simple, very basic things that we can easily check on. And, and that makes me go like, oh, duh, a checklist. You know, if there was simply a way that people gave themselves feedback, I think that would make it easier. I know it would for me. So what do you use to give yourself feedback on how you're doing with this one big whole concept, a big whole with yourself first? Giving myself feedback. Um... I guess I don't really think about it that way. Um, for me, it's, it's really focusing on what it is that I want for me. It's getting real with myself, if you will. Exercising, yes, some people think, well, gee, I just want to be a little bit more healthy or, you know, I've gained 20 pounds or what have you. Well, exercising so much more than that. I have watched people stop exercising as they get older. They can't get up off the ground. They don't move well. And I don't want that for me. So for me, exercising is far beyond just a, a something that will help keep me healthy. It's a lifestyle. It's something that will help keep me active. It's something that will help keep me wholer or more whole, more feeling that, that wholeness for me, because there's a, it's, it's more of an objective than just, oh, gee, I want to drop 20 pounds, how I look uh, type of a thing. It's about, it's about being in that lifestyle for me so that I can be active into my eighties and my nineties. We're all living longer. And I don't want to just fall apart. I want to be able to continue to be curious and to continue to, you know, use my resources and my wholeness to help shift people and get them out of their little mind box and back into their hearts, which is where we are supposed to live and where we're supposed to function from. That, that's a mission for me. And if I am not taking care of my body, my mission's going to fall short. I'm going to fall short. And I don't want that for me. And I don't want that for the world. Well, I get that. And I love the fact that you put the emphasis on wholeness and being reconnected to the body. Because that's one of the big pieces that we see over and over again is that this disconnect, you know, between the areas of our lives, you know, what we're thinking and how we're feeling and how we're physically 
um, you know, interacting, these that disconnect is showing up in huge ways as a an indicator of where we can do better, where we can do better to be more in touch with our own creativity and to support other people's creativity, where we can do better to be in touch with our own resourcefulness and to support other people to see themselves as resourceful. And that's why I love that basics that you started with there, because it's easy to see myself as resourceful if I start adding up those very simple basic things. It's yeah. so we easy forget, to go right? to the other end of the spectrum and judge myself by what I don't have access to, as right. opposed to appreciating what I do. And that's part of the disconnect as well. And when we disconnect, just, just disconnecting our ourselves from our body, you know, we, that's a dishonoring of ourselves. And when we dishonor ourselves, it, like I said earlier, when I would go against ourselves, mm. that that's, for me, it put me into depression, which was very similar to what I experienced when, when my mom died. And I, I didn't say this earlier, but I actually felt the experience and sensed the experience with my mom. And it was a deep, dark depression with hopelessness. And I don't, I, I didn't want to go back there. I didn't want to go to depression ever again. And I think that the, our anxieties, you know, the, these anxieties, these frustrations, the depression, the upset in general is because we are disconnected from ourselves more than anything. Now, I know that you have some practices that help you stay connected to yourself. So would you tell me a little bit about them? Tell us a little bit about them. Because when someone comes through the walk that you have come through, I know you have picked up some skills along the way. You know, this is important. And what you offered to share with everybody, I just want to say, Thank you so very, very much. And so talk to me a little bit about this whole practice that you've developed on energy management. I'm happy to tell you about that. We all pick up energy from other people. We don't really realize it, but we actually do. We're picking up energy constantly from the world around us. And we don't even realize that it's not our energy. And what this energy management practice does is it helps me to release the energies that aren't serving me. We pick up, you know, uh, good energies and bad energies. I'm just going to use those terms for now. And we really want to keep the energies that serve us, but we want to release those energies that don't. Like if you walk into a store and you walk out and now you're frustrated and angry, but you weren't when you walked in the store, you've just picked up a bunch of frustration and anger. So this helps you release that and, and allows you to feel and be in your own energy and not be affected by the negativity. And then uh, again, a, term I'm just going to use loosely, the negative energies that we tend to pick up from other people. So it's a visualization practice and it's powerful, powerful. And one of the, it's a great way to start learning about your body and learning about the energy that you actually have for yourself in your body. And that's what, that's one of my daily practices is this energy management visualization it, it again, very powerful, very um, effective in helping you become more stable in your energy in your body. All right, so we have time for questions to pop into the chat, but before they do, I just want to pop that link into the chat. And I forgot to hyperlink it, so I'm going to have my tech crew fix that into a hyperlink for everybody. But it's your unique heart .com. So your unique heart, how did that come about as a title for this gift? Thank you, Katie. Oh boy, um, you asked a loaded question there. Uh, there was a time that I was doing a meditation and I basically, well, no, I, there's no basic about it. I was, bas I was told in no uncertain terms <laughs> that your heart is the Bible. 
And that each heart is different and we're all unique. And our, our guide is our Bible. That's really our guide is our heart. And so if we are each unique and beautiful, then each of our hearts is unique and beautiful. And so that's how I got your unique heart to come out of that. Got it. So your heart is unique and beautiful. So I love the fact that this is an energy management practice because the idea that we actually have some control over our energy was such a foreign concept to me when I first heard about it. The idea that there was such a thing, people talked about self-control when I was growing up, but basically it meant that I, if they were talking to me about self-control, it meant that I wasn't doing what they wanted me to do. So it was less about self-control and more about them controlling my behavior. At least that was my interpretation. So this idea that we can manage, not control, manage our own energies to be able to tell, is this me or is this not me? Such a lovely, lovely place to be. So when it comes to energy management, how does that impact creativity? I think it gives you, a, well, a foundation, a base to work from. When your energy, most of us just, we're not aware of our energy. Um, and I'm just going to say, we just tend to barf out our energy and we have no control over it. It just goes bleh, out everywhere. Uh, when we start paying attention to what's going on in our energy and start becoming aware that we actually impact the, well, the universe, because our energy, we're all one, and our energy, what we think, feel, say, and do, creates energy and affects all that there is. So when, when, we, when we pull all of that together and we start looking at our energy and becoming aware of our energy, it actually becomes a force in our body, a power, I would say, in our body that allows us to be who we are from our heart. That is where the created creativity is. That's where our resourcefulness is, and that's where our wholeness comes from. So it absolutely affects th the entire spectrum of being creative, resourceful, and whole. It, it completely affects the being that we are and the being that we present to the outside world. Got it. So energy management is a great way to stimulate creativity because it gives you a solid place to start from. And I love that you brought it into the areas of resourcefulness and you brought it back around into the wholeness. I can see where that makes a big difference in people's experience of life if they know they can manage that very um, visceral experience of energy. So that is such an amazing gift. So it is in the chat. If you're listening to this and it's a recording, it's in the show notes. So. Reverend Kelly, you've taken us on this amazing journey and you have been such a huge supporter of the mission to make teen suicide a thing of the past. I just want to thank you and honor you and say, what else do you want people to know today? Did we miss anything? Because it looks like in the chat, we have covered everything that has come up, which is really kind of cool. I like that a lot. And I love the fact that there's so much interaction going on that I can see behind the scenes. This very, very, very powerful journey. And, and here's something I hadn't thought of, but I'm gonna put it out there. You tell me what you think. For me, one of the biggest pieces of the journey that you have shared is the antithesis of what's happening in the world. We know from experience that suicide is contagious. That's why we call it an epidemic. One person taking their own life in a village gives everyone in that community tacit approval to do the same thing. We see it among very tightly knit cultures. It's why suicide used to be considered a crime. It's not considered a crime anymore. And unfortunately, it's spreading like wildfire. So 
for you to be able to have an energy management practice that helps people realize where their energy is so other people's energies don't impact them the same way. It's a way to break, to use a, a, a technical term, a way to break resonance with energy that you don't want to live. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, that's part of the power of it is that it will allow you to start. Well, first of all, it starts helping you become aware of your own energy. And secondly, it helps you to shed and not be as affected by all the energies that are constantly bombarding us every day. So absolutely, you hit the nail on the head. Awesome. I had not picked up on that until this discussion, which is why I love these conversations with you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So I'm, I'm double checking to make sure we didn't miss anything in the chat and seeing some you know, happy, happy dances going on. Kelly, the journey from confused, concerned, conflicted kid whose mom took her own life to tackling the world in a way that brings the ability to tap in to our own energy and into our own power in the realms of creativity, resourcefulness, and wholeness. This is an amazing journey. Thank you very, very much for sharing it with us and for sharing that amazing gift, All right? Because that, that's really, really cool. It's, it's an honor and a privilege to be here and to support this. Uh, I, it very obviously very close to my heart that nobody goes through what we've been through, that the survivors are the ones who really deal with the fallout and the pain of the people, a pain of people going through this. I, I have felt it. I have a, uh, an unusual uh, knowledge of it. Um, I haven't attempted myself. I just felt, I felt my mom when she passed. And I don't want anybody to be there. I don't want that hopelessness, that feeling of pain and hopelessness for anybody. And it doesn't have to be. We have the power for ourselves for ourselves to stop this and really going into our heart, coming out of this box and realizing there's so much more to life. I think that helps a lot. And that's part of the mission and it's part of what you do and part of what I do and part of what this whole community does that wants to stop this epidemic and never have anybody else take their life again. There we go. Imagine a world where suicide is a thing of the past. So thank you for helping bring that world into reality, Reverend Kelly. Thank you for having me.